So Professor Jeffrey, uh, uh, interests is on how neurons encode complex space. In her lab, she studies the activity of single neurons in the hippocampus and in those regions that project to it in order to understand what environmental information uh, the cells use to form their map of space. They studied as in rats uh, and mice, but also humans. And my understanding is uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey's research is uh, uh, in particular looking to the composition of three-dimensional spaces. So um, uh, Kate will be hosting the session two papers, but I would ask her to maybe elaborate a little bit more on uh, her research in her lab at UCL. And, uh, and then perhaps we can have some, some debate and Q and A's. Thank you. Um, yes, I feel like a slight outlier at this meeting as a, as a neuroscientist, but, um, but I research space and I've been interested for a long time in this system in the brain called the hippocampal system, which seems to be involved in making a mental map of your surroundings that is then used to anchor memory for life events. So space and memory are really closely interlinked in the brain and we're trying to understand how it works and you know what happens when it goes wrong and all of, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I've, over the years, I've gotten particularly interested in a couple of aspects of that. One is the sense of direction turns out to be incredibly important for your understanding of space and your orientation in space. So, so by that, I mean knowing which way you're facing so that when you um, encounter things like features in the room or features in the outside world, you kind of know where to place them in your mental map because you know which way you're facing. That, it turns out to be really critical. And um, my feeling is that that's not been fully appreciated by people who are designing you know, the, the built environment. So I've gotten interested in the last few years in trying to talk with architects about some of these things that we found out about space. Um, and yeah, the other big thing that I've been looking at is three-dimensional space. So, so how do we integrate our um, experiences of vertical space in with horizontal space and, you know, to make a three-dimensional map? And, you know, very speculatively, could we even go beyond that? Like, do we have the capacity to represent four-dimensional space or five-dimensional space? And um, of course, the real world is three-dimensional, so we haven't been able to ask these questions, but the virtual world gives us all sorts of new possibilities. And um, so, I've, so I'm kind of interested in um, virtual reality and uh, how you would design virtual environments that would let us play around. So um, yeah, so I try to hang out with architects as much as I can, <laughs> see if I can learn some things. Um, and so I've really, it's, it's an honor to be asked to chair the session. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Right, okay. So we have some questions. I, I have uh, one question uh, for Patrick. And it's mainly like this virtual world option, this virtual space option seems, at least when I'm experiencing VR at, at UCL and, and playing with uh, our colleagues in computer science, it seems to occasionally it feels better than real reality. And then when you take the headset off, you, you are kind of a little bit disappointed with the real world. So, so how do you see this uh, becoming something that is not what they would call in Cambridge, a utilitarian machine, a machine that simply give everything we dream of but in reality is somehow killing us because it's, uh, it's detach detaching us from the physical world. Is, the, is this a, a fair question to ask? Perhaps, I'm not sure if I 100% understand, but um, well, I mean, at the moment, I mean, the, we have, uh, architects use VR just to uh, present the anticipated building. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's firmly rooted in, uh, let's say, Usually, these buildings have, have um, you know, business purposes and, and functionality criteria, which I've tried to talk about, which actually, uh, uh, ref I think, it, it, it deeply refer back to questions of perceptual tractability and comprehensibility of the environment, particularly when it comes to complexity. So I think that's, that's on one hand, and, and we use VR to, we can test that. We simulate and, and actually client respond very well to that. 
Uh, but but I think on the other hand, you have the VR, which is standalone. And at the moment, it's I don't see much um, other than you know distraction, entertainment. Uh, let's say bad movies and bad <laughs> bad games. Uh, 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 you know. So so what I see is um, if the virtual um, spaces become actually working spaces which are uh, which have a different set of performance criteria which are very much closely substitutes or maybe uh, collaborate with real spaces that brings a different mindset in uh, and set of criteria and rigor to uh, designing these so, so I don't know if it's better or worse I mean of course we can um, we can then also think about um, certain of we're not tied to the, the physical constraints in this but what i feel is that we have um we can build on the learning and orientation and navigation and situation reading uh capacity we've evolved uh, uh individually also in our life with, with in, in in real spaces and of course that's the analogy to transfer them that into the comprehending and navigating the you know uh uh, these virtual spaces, and this was similar with the magazine analogy or with the kind of uh, folder filing systems analogy. We, we we bring this in, and I think that's where it, what I think uh, is is one important aspect where architects bring a lot of expertise. But the other thing is that I really see that we will inhabit both real and virtual spaces, and if they totally disparate. I don't think they'd be missing something. So there needs to be some kind of synergy. That's an economy of learning, an economy of comprehension, also an economy of representing an institution. You know, if you have a, you know, a, so 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 you don't have to double up. So because in the end they work they work together. And I think one could be overlaid on the other. You know, where you have one of the walls being that screen, the the, the, the the meeting space extension, or you have the overlay with Google glasses, or now a kind of Google <laughs> visor or something. So that's where I see the, the, the agenda. And, and and at the moment we have having these worlds relatively separate, I would say, in terms of the, the, the you know, you the, the gaming world isn't isn't treated uh, is is entertainment. It's a, it's not um, um, yet, or but I see tendencies to bring it into and have more performance, particularly as I said, some of these things become social media and Facebook's getting interested in that I consider as real work, real communication work, collaboration, information, communication, which I think is 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 what this what what this is we we as architects can 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 own that space. I support in an overall collaboration. I mean the same with the built environment, we're only owning, let's say, an aspect of it. But I think Critically, we owning the phenomenological and semiological aspect, uh, and, and not necessarily the technical aspect. And the same would be in the world, in the virtual world, where we where we have under under the hood a lot of technical uh, constraints and requirements, which we need to then artistically uh, work with. And that's another form of let's say tectonism in the world mm -hmm. for the virtual. Yes, uh, yeah, that's that's amazing. There's a question here for uh, Ali. Uh, it's a short question. Um, from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> so uh, could you tell us a bit more about uh, the crit, the crit uh, in the creative process? The various examples you showed requires different types of critics. Yeah, so it's, uh, that's a, a really interesting question. So the, the, the work that I presented um, falls within um, a, a framework that is very well studied in machine learning called uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, and the, this framework kind of studies the relationship between the process of generation and the process of discrimination or criticism. Now, in, in the typical machine learning context, you have um, a, an unboundedly powerful generator and you have an unboundedly powerful critic and they're both competing with each other uh, to fool each other. In the work that I just presented, the, one of the unique things about the creator is that it's restricted by the paintbrush. So it can't produce any image that it wants. It has to produce an image that is uh, producible by a paintbrush. And what this means is that it actually becomes trivial for the critic to distinguish 
one of the agent's creations from reality. Like the critic can look at the image and say, of course, this is not a real photograph. Like, I don't have to work very hard to tell, that, tell you that. And what that means is that the critic is actually always winning. The, the agent never wins in this, in this game that we set up for it. Um, and we get around this with uh, two techniques. One is that we, to the extent that we can, we restrict the critic. So we make it uh, very small and we um, regularize it in machine learning terminology to make sure that it doesn't become too good at its job. Um, and then the second thing that we do is we, we tell the agent to not be bothered about whether it wins or not, but to focus more on how difficult it can make the, the job for the critic. So in 100% of what I've shown you, the critic knows that it's looking at a fake image, um, but it still assigns a score. So it says this looks 99% fake, this looks 97% fake and so on. And the agent is trying to bring that number down. So like when it's doing really well, it's only 97% fake, for instance. Yes. Um, and yeah, just, just, to, just to end that it, it is important. Like we did use simpler critics, for instance, um, just analytical critics that weren't neural networks. And what you find there is that the agent just produces blurry images as opposed to conceptual. So there's some properties about the critic that are necessary for this conceptual um, representation formation, but we don't really understand very well what they are. Okay. I just want to, uh, I mean, you, you've been a bit hesitant with uh, ascribing creativity to the system. I, I don't know, I wouldn't do that. I mean, it, 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 we shouldn't allow that to be kind of undermined um, because it leads to some kind of mystification of how we are created because I think it's, it's in parallel things. We also are super, we are computers, supercomputers perhaps. <laughs> and there's mechanisms behind that we're trying to retrieve, I guess, in terms of neuroscience, et cetera. And so that's the first thing. And I feel that it's, 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 it is in two ways creative, that process on the one hand, in terms of the generation of the overall intelligence, which then becomes also in each instance, a creative intelligence. So it's a double creativity to generate the, 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 the intelligence, but then each act, I think, of interpretation, of conceptualization is, is then for me also the create, cre creative act. It doesn't, uh, um, uh, even, uh, uh, um, well, I just would leave it there because I don't know what would speak against that other than a kind of mystified uh, 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 presumption that something mechanical can't be uh, creative. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I would say that from, from my perspective, um, this is, uh, the system does have elements of creativity. It is an instance of a creative system. I would just be hesitant to reduce human creativity to the equations in the system because uh, humans have, um, we incorporate much more information and experience into that creative process. It's not just visual, it's also uh, linguistic, it's also emotional, it's also based on culture and history and so on. And we bring all of that to bear when we design a building or we design a piece of work. This system has only ever seen photographs of faces, for instance. So it's very, it's a very reduced creative system. Well, that was an important point because that the, that it, that it finds its, uh, and the own way in inverted commas, without the explicit instruction of of abstracting and representing, particularly when you reduce, when the heuristics of a reduced kind of number of moves it can make. Yeah. Uh, in both instances anyway, I find it I find it fascinating. I would accept it as criticism, as creative because, and I would invite such system into a collaborative work environment. Um, uh, I could hire staff or could hire let a system and both would be kind of learning in the process and become an element in a collaborative process. And they, they, they're, they're similarly kind of semi the black boxes to me as somebody who was, was building a creative team or something. And the same is the way I wanted to talk. And that's what you want also. You want from, um, from your collaborators to be kind of self-directed self-learning because from the top you can't, you don't want kind of robots in the bad sense of having to instruct everybody explicitly and you don't want to go around with a remote control <laughs> or explicit instructions. And that would just be not, uh, we want swarm intelligence with a lot of self-directed creative uh, participants and creative isn't necessarily a kind of just a random gesture, but it is also um, 
is solution oriented. So it is a kind of rational creativity, uh, some kind of um, structure and, and, and with, with feedback and success and failure kind of um, 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 scores, creativity. Okay. So that's that's uh, it's very interesting. I'm glad that we're recording this because I, I need to study the answers uh, in doing course. Uh, just one one final question for Kate Jeffrey before we start uh, section section two. So there is a question from Provides In, and uh, she she is asking. I am seeing a lot of a 4D simulation engines that use methods of tunneling to pack 300 rooms into four. This is not only this not only affect our sense of space, but also may benefit the use of a VR within the limitations of the physical space. With the use of a E8 leech lattice typo, typologies, etc., they may uh, immerse, bring immense potential for uh, for creating spaces beyond 4D. And then the question goes on and on. So, do you have a specific uh, project examples to show the impact of uh, using three plus dimensions uh, in the brain and how this is this is manifested or encoded in the brain. Um, well, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't really gone very far down this road. I mean, one of the things that's come out of the study of three dimensional space is that it looks like the brain um, doesn't make a fully three-dimensional um, representation, but uses a sort of a basically um, flat map at multiple levels. So it makes lots of flat maps. So we're in the process of working through the data to see whether this is really true under all conditions, but it sort of looks like where possible the brain tries to simplify things. But we have a kind of subjective feeling of three-dimensional space. So that has led to the idea that maybe we could um, get away with um, using um, lower dimensional representations um, bolted together to make arbitrarily higher dimensional um, conceptual spaces. But I haven't done any research on this and I'm, I'm not aware of anybody who has. There have been one or two attempts, I think, to start to look at this, but it's, it's very early days. Um, but I'm interested in the, the things that were mentioned at the start of that question and I'll go back and look and see. Sure. Yes, yeah. fantastic. Uh, with that, uh, I will conclude this opening uh, keynote and, and presentations. Uh, and I'll ask Professor K. Jeffrey to maybe call the first paper. I would like to thank you very much Patrick Schumacher for his time and Ali for his time to present uh, on this conference. And then now we'll have the, the design cognition session. Uh, and this session is mainly looking to um, how we understand design from the perspective of the practitioner, but also from the perspective of the user. And, uh, and uh, we, we try to give uh, a framing to the problem from the uh, cognitive psychology and neuroscience perspective and how we can extract some uh, algorithms that can help us to design better.